We now call this uh, City of Norco City Council uh, Budget Workshop to order. If the clerk will take the roll, please. Councilmember Newton. Here. Councilmember Hoffman. Here. Councilmember Bash. Hold on. Mayor Pro Tem Hanna. Here. Mayor Grenmeyer. Yes. Thank you. All are present. Thank you. At this time, we'll stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, led by Councilmember Newton. Thank you. The flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So we have a couple, well we have one item on the agenda for today. So our city council business items will proceed in this manner. Uh, we will have a staff report and presentation, um, councils, questions of staff, any public speakers for, against, or neutral on the topic. Uh, and then it will come back to council for discussion and direction. So our agenda item today is continuation of the capital improvement bud program budget for fiscal years 2020 through 2024. And Gina, hello. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I will pass it on to Chad to uh, begin the presentation for the CIP. I believe you have the clicker. Or is it Brian's turn? <laughs> I'll jump in here. <clears throat> So um, this is uh, Fund 142. Uh, we kind of ended at this spot because of time. Uh, this was the EVP program. It's a carryover project. And then the fire station flooring. And then Station 57 improvements also include basically a replacement of the doors um, uh, on the bay doors here. And this is a, a, an, an estimate uh, we received. Um, obviously, uh, we recently I talked to Battalion Chief Lane and we looked at another option uh, as an alternative to this. That actual option came in a little higher uh, than this, but uh, again, our goal would be to work with uh, the fire department on the specifications and standards um, and then put this out to competitive bid. Can we start with a question right there? Sure. Okay, so in this $120,000, that includes your roofing repair? Nope. That's just... Uh, bay doors. Two bay doors? Yes, sir. Okay, so... Bay doors, motors, all apparatus to that. Correct. And uh, meeting with the chief at Station 57, they have a bid for the two doors for $44,000. And I believe there was, uh, oh, let's just say another uh, $10,000 possibly for a new motor and uh, the, the light curtains. So uh, uh, after discussions with Chief Lane, and um, so I went ahead and got another bid from another contractor and it was 44300 So the 44000 seems to be a legitimate bid for the uh, replacement of those two doors. And, and that included labor and prevailing wage? Absolutely. Okay. And that's the bid that the fire department has, is 44,000. These are the numbers I worked on with the fire department, so if we want to adjust it, I have no problem doing so. Well, I'd like to adjust it, but also based on our conversations at Station 57, since those doors are 23 feet wide, if you go with uh, the Porvine or Cooks in either one curtain door, Right. And we took a tour of station uh, 17. Those those sheet doors, those curtain doors are going to rattle dramatically. And part of our discussion was that you just replace the motor on the the on, west door. That's correct. The, those sectional doors that you have are pretty heavy duty. They don't blow in the wind. Uh, there's nothing actually wrong with them. 
that part of our discussion was spend $6,000 on the east door, upgrade the motor to a motor that is sized correctly, which is what you replace the, the west side motor with, and for all our fire stations, for both stations, enter into a preventive maintenance agreement that will run $600 a year. That where they can, you know, grease the tracks, check the springs, oil what's necessary, and adjust the motors. So, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, Brian, just right out of the gate, it's like, why well, are we going to spend $120,000 where we could be much smarter and spend 6000 Are you saying don't replace the east door? Do not replace the door. That's the door that tore out and it's... It was the motor 20, that was replaced. No, on the west side, but we on the east door, we actually had a failure in fatigue in the metal. We had to come back and fabricate yeah. that back. Uh, yeah, all I, that Those doors need to be replaced. Yeah, but the fatigue in that metal was just the, the arm bracket. Yeah, I... From I, I think that's a horrible design for those fire doors. But by the way, on those bay doors, there is no secondary way to open those up. If we can't get them open, then we hope the other door works so that that unit can back out or move forward. Okay, well then you make the argument for the, 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 the sheet doors. Those are only $44,000. For the curtain doors? For the curtain doors. And then... When the chief calls and says he can't sleep at night because the door's rattling and keeping them up, then... Right now we have the captain complaining because the door, the west side door rattles right now. But, so. All I'm saying is I looked what was fatigued and that was just a simple mounting bracket. So th that's all I have to say about that. Chief, did you want to weigh in on any of that right out of the gate? <laughs> I think to uh, we want we definitely want to do what what is the best cost and the most efficient. I think we would all uh, the uh, all agree, and, and we could we can continue to sidebar. Perhaps you know we we could meet meet up and, and uh, discuss it further. You know we we don't need to go spend the men, the money until we know we, we we're all on the same page. And that, and that could take a little bit uh, difference in philosophies in the doors. And I completely understand that. Um, you can completely understand both both. Uh, both discussions there, but the right price, most efficient, and operational need, I think we can we can get there and, and do the right thing. I think the the maintenance program you suggested is well worth it, and at six hundred dollars, we can do that for six hundred dollars a year. I think it's well worth it. And they're so heavily used; the number of times those things go up and down, it's. I think that's money well spent for us too. You got your quote from for $120,000. I'd like to see that. As like I said, the, the the chief's quote was 44000 Thank you. So I guess I have a question. How, if there was to be an amendment to the 120,000, and let's say we take it down to 50,000 for a cushion, like is that the process for today? Do we make a motion to amend and then it's just Yeah, corrected? we can make that adjustment and then based on that, once we finalize the specifications with fire, send it out to bid, then we bring those back. And would one of those bids include the one that the chief already has in hand, or sure. does that person reapply for a bid, or how does that? Oh no, they would have it had to go out competitively. Okay, so then that person yeah, just and submits it, and, again, and then it would be whatever vendor comes in as the low bid. Okay, we would specify the type of door that that Agreed. meets the needs, mm -hmm. and then we would bid that. Okay, so does that come at the conclusion of this? Any amendments come at the end of the report, I would assume, when it comes back to council? Yeah. One, of the, uh, one of the difficulties uh, finalizing a study session the day the budget is to be adopted. But what I would suggest is for the finance director to keep a track um, if this is the only adjustment that you want to make to this uh, category, we can make it now. Um, and then those numbers, uh, the numbers for this uh, capital improvement program uh, will change 
and uh, we will uh, obviously uh, recap that at the end when the budget is is adopted. Okay, Ted, did you have a comment yeah, or a question? I, I would hope that in all these bids and stuff that we're planning that we're not expecting to spend the whole amount that we approved and that we do best practices and go for the best cost effectiveness of this thing just because we're going to allocate $120,000 doesn't mean that staff can spend $120,000. We would expect that they would go out for the best price and maybe look at a half half of that. But what with the capital project, once we would go out to bid, you would award the contract based on this project element, and that's what would be awarded for the contract plus possibly contingency. Yeah, and that's what I'm saying. If it's is not spent, then it stays in the fund balance. Well, I would understand that. It's just, it's one of those things that's a frustrating part because I've, we're all doing it with budgets, and right now budgets are a big topic, and I don't want to uh, beleaguer the thing. And we see it happening all the time up in Sacramento. We see it happening in big cities. You know, $36,000 for six units of, uh, of Sharps containers because that's what they want in downtown LA. Six containers, Sharps containers, $36,000. Give me a break. I'm going to buy them on eBay for 50 bucks a piece. That's what we're getting at, is that we have, this is the taxpayer's money, and we have to be cognizant of that, because if we sit $120,000 like this, and Councilman Newton's right, let's get the best competitive bid on these things. Thank you. One of, I think one of the issues we're dealing with here is we're using the term bid very loosely here. Um, none of this is, is a bid yet. Uh, the bids will be uh, obtained, obviously, before a contract is awarded. Uh, I suppose what Brian is, is, uh, has got out is some cost estimate uh, from a third party. Uh, we don't know what the bids will come in at until we lay out the specifications and actually uh, put that sp specification out on the street for people to bid, we don't know what those bids are going to be. This is just uh, a cost estimate so that we can have a number uh, in the budget. It, so I kind of want to, it, it would be good to clarify that so that uh, we're not talking about costs when we should actually be speaking about a cost estimate that is obtained in order to uh, uh, plus a number for, for the CIP budget. Well, I guess my frustration comes in that if the cap's set, then that's the number they can go up to. And if we know that that's way out of the category, I think the cap needs to be brought down because I can say, oh, well, I'm going to encumber $6,000 for an ice machine. That should cost 2500 to 3000 And then what do you know? The invoice comes in at 5800 So I don't want to give leeway for that kind of stuff to happen. And if my only tool to do so is to make sure that these numbers are in a reasonable ballpark, then that's my responsibility to do so. Yeah, and I agree with you. Those numbers should be in a reasonable ballpark even before they go in the, in the budget. So, so that's where I'm at. Right. Just to confirm, we'll reduce the Station 57 improvements from 120000 to 50000 uh, Can I speak up? Well, actually it would be $54,600. And um, just, just so we're clear on all this, just all the years that I spent on the Park and Rec Commission, um, there will be times when you go out and the bid that you get will be a lot different than what people say it's going to be. So I would suggest Let's put it at sixty thousand, so that Greg had said fifty-four thousand because forty-four thousand plus ten thousand plus the six hundred for the preventative maintenance comes to fifty-four thousand six hundred. I would suggest make it sixty thousand. It the just if I can, the preventive maintenance program would be part of the general fund budget. Well, it would not be part of the capital budget. One because okay. it's an ongoing type so, of cost. But still sixty thousand. I think that gives you a buffer and. Uh, that includes your number. I mean, would that's fair.
Um, trying to get to the, this is 132. Um, we have a transfer general government projects at 291. This is part of the city hall uh, improvement program uh, and security program, uh, which also has measure R money request as well. Um, trying to get to the next slides, because some of these we went through on the measure R. Um, this one kind of capitalates uh, the successor agency money that we're transferring. Uh, last year we, we previously talked about the city entrance landscaping at River Road is 80,000 and then this would be the transfer of the 291,000 which would be used for City Hall improvements at the Sheriff Station for security and City Hall which includes the counter. Um, the um, 80,000 uh, dollars was to uh, add landscaping and primarily trees uh, on River Road. This uh, between Sundance and uh, uh, Corydon. Um, this is something we talked about last year. Uh, I do want to say though that it, that would be something that would be need, need to be discussed next fiscal year with the assessment district, which that area is, because they would need to increase their assessment to state to maintain those trees. So that would be something as part of a Prop 218 hearing, we would need to talk to them. They would have to have some sort of increase in there. Um, Again, this is what has previously been discussed. Uh, we held off on this until the development was done and we had gone down the road a little bit on this. Ryan. Yeah. Before you get off that page, run by that, uh, the security and stuff like that again. That I, we've talked about <coughs> City Hall. Yeah, there's 291,000 that comes from this fund, and then there is uh, Measure I believe has $210,000 identified to it. So this money would go towards uh, the City Hall Sheriff Station improvements for security, uh, and would include uh, the upgrade for cameras. Uh, it would also the DVR, um, the server, uh, all of those things would be part of uh, our upgrades, particularly on the sheriff side. And and then on the uh, city hall side, this would include uh, the count design and counter improvements uh, at city hall. All right, explain the, the counter improvements. What we're going to do to protect the people up here at the counters? But not we, not in the sheriff's department, but the yeah. the city hall and the parks department and everything there. Explain that again. So what this will do is we would be hiring an architect to come in and work with us to provide a customer-friendly counter that has a bare barrier of some sort, we haven't defined what that exactly is going to be, that would allow uh, reduce potential intrusion coming over the counter. It separates the employees from uh, the people who uh, come to the counter. It gives them that added protection. You're seeing this done in a lot of public and government facilities all over uh, the country now. And so this would be adding to that. It also would take where our cashier locations are and provide additional security in those locations. It also would be placing cameras in those locations. But for, forget the cameras, they're not security. I mean, you could take your iPad and stand back there in that door and let the lieutenant put three rounds to it. It's not going to stop a bullet. I'm talking about, I, I still. Whether it's going to be bulletproof glass or some other type of secure yeah, barrier, we haven't we haven't gotten that far. We need to bring someone in well, design and work with us on that. Something we need to do because of the way everything's going, and like I said, those commissions I'm on, they're all going to that. Everybody's behind locked doors and glass. It don't make any difference what the public thinks. It's to protect the employees. The banks have been doing it for years and years and years. Gas stations have been doing it for years. I just have a problem with not uh, putting them behind a little bit stronger barrier than... than yeah, when I say barrier, it's because we have not defined what that's going to be. That'll be, that'll come back from as part of one of the architectural features. And once we do that, we can bring that back to council to show you what that'll look like, actually. Yeah, well, I was just trying to get a cost on it. I mean, when we asked you to do this here a while back, I figured we'd get the cost on, yeah, on and total total protection instead it, of just halfway doing something. Yeah, some of our challenges are, um, do we go 
the ceiling, which is a very tall ceiling, or do we go with a six foot or eight foot? So those are the things we need to look at and, and kind of get a feel for because costs will change based on how high. If it's an eight foot or 10 foot, or if we go all the way to the ceiling, then that obviously we have very tall ceilings in that location. It would changes the price. So that's what we want to work with in Arctic so we can actually see what that visually will look like and meet with the staff at work, that work at those counters to kind of get a feel of what is going to work for them operationally as well. Um, and this is the 141 uh, Parks Development Fund. Um, we are proposing to replace the gym floor. The gym floor is at 19 years of age. It has served really well and it's uh, uh, for us. It has actually lasted longer than what we were expecting it to. It is a synthetic floor. Uh, this particular floor uh, we would be replacing with an, an alike type floor. Uh, the technology is much, much more advanced now. Uh, it does come with a vapor barrier underneath it. Um, and <clears throat> this would be, we. this last couple years, we've had problems with bubbling and uh, ripples, which is just a sign of really the age of the floor. And so uh, we would be replacing it, and uh, this would uh, get us another 15 to 20 years out of the floor. Uh, some people have asked why not go to a wooden floor. Uh, for to create, uh, we looked at that originally uh, years ago, and the cost for a wood floor and then the ongoing maintenance of a wood floor is pretty expensive. And on this floor, we, they would be recommending to do uh, some sort of a sleeper under it, uh, one because of the moisture that's in that concrete uh, area. Uh, the type of floor that we do, synthetic, uh, uh, the moisture uh, a barrier gives it protects our warranty and it's part of the new flooring the last time we did it we actually had to bring a separate barrier in and then put the floor on it so uh, it's held up really well except for the last couple years we've had some issues and we've actually had to cut sections out and have it redone so this would be putting in a, a new uh, floor for the gymnasium Brian mm -hmm. is the is the floor bubbling because of predominantly through the, the the moisture coming up through the concrete slab or is it also because the roof leaks it, no it it it's just really the the padding has started to break down okay. when we cut it open and you look at it there, there's no moisture barrier left and then to the actual uh, it's starting to degrade so it's back basically when you're looking at a, a piece of rubber basically sure. it is slowly okay wearing itself down and over the years it's just deteriorated and degraded itself to a point where it is it isn't when we originally did it we had moisture issues it was more riley jim sits in the lowest spot right so we when we first did it we actually put a french drain around riley jim and we have connect into the storm drain there so that helped us a lot in reducing the moisture in that slab the vapor barrier, which is another rubber barrier we put down, was to give us that added protection. And that has helped us along the way. It's just the last few years. And when you tear it open and you start looking at it, it's really that the rubber is degraded Got it. to a point. Okay. And what happens is it, for lack of a better word, it shifts. So as it starts to break down underneath, you're, as opposed to it being more firm, it starts to do this. That leads to potential injury, so it's, it's time. Uh, when we brought TerraFlex out, who we spec, um, they were amazed that it's lasted as many years as it has. And so uh, for, for all we did the last time, I think it, it, it served us well. So. And we would coordinate this also with the roof repair of the building. Yeah, that comes up in the in part of the measure R. I, I'm doing most of all of the roofs uh, out at one contract to get my best price, and so uh, and we would release those in the fall. Uh, the best time for the roofing for us in our section is in the fall outside of when the school districts in the summer are redoing all of theirs. So that's when we would release our bid. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, Ingalls Park Event Center improvements. Uh, there are two areas here. Uh, one is the 156, 465, and then the other section is uh, 83,000. These are carryovers that are part of the budget. Uh, our Ingalls Park uh, Development Committee um, looked at this and we, we set up some priorities, uh, mainly because there, obviously there's a lot of things we could do up there, but there are some real key issues that the committee felt were important. One, we have some drainage issues on Marino Arena and around uh, uh, Nellie Weaver Hall. There's a little bit of some issues that we need to do related to uh, Clark Arena as well. Uh, our, one of our problems is the water we collect uh, in a in a light storm isn't is bad isn't a problem, but in heavy storms, what it, the the downspouts actually overrun, um, and the uh, the water actually shoots back up out of those drains, and then we flood out the arena and the back pens. So we're going to look at how we can maybe mitigate that, whether we run another line. Uh, we'll have to look at some engineering on this. Um, and uh, it's really to improve it. The other side of uh, Nellie Weaver Hall, which is the east side, uh, we have some issues with drainage and natural springs that uh, percolate out of the east slope off of Nellie Weaver Hall. This would look at what we would need to do to mitigate that. That, uh, catch that, put it in a drain, and put it in the culvert is, that was, is just to the south of Nellie Weaver Hall. Um, the uh, Ingalls, um, the Parmeter Park improvement, this 48,000, um, this is from uh, the cell sites as part of their public improvement funding that they did for that park. Uh, we would be looking at redoing the infield and outfield and giving that facility a facelift. Uh, we also would be replacing a few of our fixtures and upgrading that to the muscle lighting, which would match the new muscle lighting that we're receiving on two of those poles. This, by doing this, this, this facility uh, becomes a very uh, great field for, particularly for girls softball. Uh, and we have our travel programs, uh, uh, including uh, the high school that would have interest in seeing this being used uh, or being improved upon, as well as our uh, Norco Girls Softball Association, particularly in the off season. Uh, this field really just needs that attention. It's been around for a long time. Uh, this type of facelift would give us uh, a both infield and outfield uh, uh, facelift. Uh, just to note, we do have drainage issues there, but Chad is doing a public works project along there that will catch all of the drainage water and take it somewhere else for us. So we're really happy about that. Can I so the infill will no longer flood out, we hope. I just have a question. By the way, I played Little League on that field. It was their opening day. How about that? <laughs> um, the pole barns at uh, Ingalls Park, what, where, what, where are we at with those? Um, it's not on here. It's actually identified. Uh, our committee talked about this too to start really working on it. Um, I've actually identified uh, design and money going into next year's uh, uh, mean measure getting, R getting funding. Getting rid of the pole barns and then building new ones? Uh, yes, that would be the long term plan. We would work with our community groups. Uh, there's a lot of ideas passed along. It's not a real cheap fix. Uh, so it's really trying to look at what is what do we really want to see the an end in mind there, and then trying to design to that. We're looking at about 25,000 square feet total if you were to count the floor space on all of those pole barns. So it's pretty good size. So how we do it is something we're going to have to collectively work on and start to look at. The subcommittee uh, has it's it's on their list. We had a discussion on this at our last meeting, and uh, it is something. When I last had it looked at, uh, we had about a seven-year span. So we're on the five-year downward spiral to do something with it. So, um, so for taking a look at that and forecasting it, putting money in design, and then um, a lot depends on what they want in the end. Um, it do we do a fully enclosed facility or just more of a cover type facility? How are we going to get best use out of that? Those are part of the discussions that we're going to be having uh, with the, the community, our commissions, and our subcommittee. Thank you. I think I've completed all of my CIPs. 
Um, and I'll turn this over to Chad. And if I miss something, do I have one more? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I don't know why that didn't come up, but I have um, animal control. Um, the project for animal control is, um, my apologies for not catching it faster than that. Uh, the, the project for animal control is basically putting a shade cover, similar to what we've looked at with Little League. Um, this has been a project that has been discussed for a long time. Uh, we have donation money and um, we uh, are putting some uh, improvement money. Uh, animal control has collected and does collect a diff fund. Uh, it doesn't collect a lot, uh, however, or has over the time. Uh, but it, uh, yeah, here it is. So what we would be doing is uh, you would see from impact fees about $29.35 uh, transfer from the general fund. This is our donation fund of about $15,408. And, uh, this, um, and this would is our estimate of about $32,000, and that would include, include the engineering on that structure as well. Um, and this would create our adoption area, which is on the north side of animal control, uh, is out in the shade. Uh, it just creates a more friendly area for us to create adoptions for pam families to meet and greet the uh, dog that they are looking at adopting or perhaps the cat. Um, and so this area would be shaded. Uh, we've had people make donations over the past to do improvements there, and this would be coming from that fund account. Brian, are those donations the ones we get from Horse Week or that? Okay. Horse Week and others, and uh, we actually had a, a scout who did a project up there and then donated the rest of their scout money. But I know when Tony comes in and they, they dump a big check in there, is that those funds or is that? That's part of that is in there, yes. Okay. That concludes, and then I'll get over to Chad. I'm good, Brian. I got, I got a computer. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So the first uh, slide we'll discuss is the storm drain fund project. As you know, um, predominantly most of the work that we fortunately get done within the city of managing our storm drain system is provided by flood control, and we've certainly. Um, up on that offer and built quite a few systems um, in uh, the last three years. Uh, going through the projects themselves, we at times need minor drain storage improvement projects. We always put a small amount that's general funded. Funded. That's not from from flood control. That's one of the few items that we actually fund directly. Uh, but because sometimes project comes up from flood control or from residential issues that we want to address, and we'll use that those funds to do things. We've re honestly really had to use it on a year to year basis, but we keep it there as a placeholder to do that work if we need to. Um, the next two items are ones we just recently added in because we got permission from flood control. They're smaller projects and basically what this is is, is design of, of one project and a redesign. Um, there's two areas where Norco High School is um, that it get flooding. Um, there is a storm drain in front of Norco High School on Temescal, but it's currently crushed in a couple different places and it ends up going to um, the, um, it's supposed to go to the flood channel, the, the, what they call the South Norco Channel. Um, but what we convinced flood control to do is if we come up with a new design to replace it, would they replace it in their about to start um, South Norco Channel project? And they said yes, we just have to pay to get it designed. They'll include it as a change order with their contractor and they'll put that in. Because we already have the easement for going through the properties to take it to there. We're just basically taking the old out, putting the new in. We just have to do a quick design on that. So we put add the money in, that's going to be um, general fund money to do that. It, they're not covering that design, um, but it's minor. We've already gotten the quotes as far as what it would take to, to do that design. Um, and then there's another problem behind the high school where there, water is coming through in the back portion of the high school from the north and kind of flooding out the field areas, et cetera, and we want to grab the pipe. Um, 
or the, uh, some of that water from that area and take it to the South Norco Channel to remove some of that water. Again, it's a minor design project, um, which we have to fund, but they will do the actual improvements again as a change order to the overall South Norco Channel project. So if we quickly get it started and get the design to them before they get too far in the project, uh, actual construction, they can include it as a change order to help mitigate some problems that the schools is being impacted with. So we added those two in. But I just want to make sure you knew that those two particular ones are being funded by the city to do, but it's just the design. They will do all the construction, everything. Um, then we usually keep a placeholder for relocating utilities from time to time as far as then they do certain storm rain projects, storm, uh, flood control will find an unknown utility that's ours, you know, a water line that we have to adjust and we pay those costs. So we just, it's a minor line item that we keep there. Uh, the major projects, um, some of these are existing that are just carryovers. Some are just about to finish, but it will carry over the next year. But we have Crestview Drive, Arlington, that one is basically finished design, um, and we're going to go out fairly soon. Uh, and that basically is grabbing the water from 8th uh, on Crestview, and that goes all the way down to Arlington. We're going to capture that water, keep it underground, and take it across the street to the existing uh, open channel that's on the other side near the uh, nursery. But that's basically finished. We're going to about go out to bid for that. Um, the lateral uh, in Pedley Avenue uh, from from Riverview Elementary School. Um, that's basically going from um, Seventh Street all the way to the end. To um, well, let me apologize. We're capturing the water just south of um, the elementary school, and because we get a lot of flooding in that area, and we're going to take it south. Uh, towards the existing drainage system. Part of that will include later on what we're talking about is actually repaving that whole road to between 7th all the way to the river. So we're going to do the storm drain, get it all done, and then do some roadway improvements to get that road all finished. Uh, that one has actually already been awarded um, and the contractors expect to start uh, maybe maybe by the end of this month, but that's our, that project's already moving forward. Uh, this is a new project, which is NA6, which is on 5th Street. We have two locations along 5th Street where we get a lot of flooding. Uh, one is near 5th and Temescal, um, and uh, the other is basically between um, Corona and um, uh, Sierra. We, we get flooding on both areas. So it's trying to grab water in different locations and basically take it down to the existing system that exists uh, near the... Um, the 15 freeway. So it's just grabbing water along that whole stretch uh, in different ways and then taking it um, and getting it out of the area. Uh, so those are two projects we're going to do and design and, and hopefully get under construction this next year. Uh, the Pedley, um, the N11C, the Pedley to Green Tree, that's basically already finished. There's minor work that still needs to be done, striping, etc. Some improvements on um, on the project that we think may end up being carrying over the next year. So we just carried a little bit of money over, but it's basically the project's finished. Uh, the N4 extension, which is 4th Street, that one's currently under uh, design. That's where we're trying to grab water. Halfway between 4th and 3rd, there's a low point there that impacts a couple homes um, in that area. And then we're going to take it down towards 3rd. And then so that's currently design. Uh, we're starting to review the first submittals from the, from the design engineer on that. And then we have... Um, Valley View, sorry, I think I was mistaken here. N4 is 4th Street. I'm sorry, I, I was describing Valley View. That's N5, that's where we're grabbing that water. Uh, N4, I gotta remind myself, I'll go back to that one in a second. Sorry, I'm, I'm drawing a blank. Uh, Line ND, which is California and Crestview. Uh, that work is currently in construction, hopefully it will be done soon, but it's likely to carry over uh, into the new fiscal year, so we've, we've left the funding there, but it's basically most of the project's been done. We just haven't received many of the invoices. But it's Chad, on that one, hmm? is that the one that cleans the drain up from Crestview down to California so we don't have the open ditch on the Snows property anymore? Uh, no, no, that's the one that flood control is doing on their own. Okay. That's NA1-1. Okay, so that, and that's not NARS because they're funding and building that. All right. Yeah. Thank you. This is down on California, uh, basically more to the north, All trying right. to collect some of that water that does get through, so through some of those existing open channels, and trying to grab some of that water. That's on on California. So we're gonna. 
County Flood Control is taking care of the snow as property. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that project's, for the most part, has been finished. They're just doing the paving. They've done all the infrastructure as far as the storm drain. Now they're just trying to finish off the paving. All right. Um, so we have S2, uh, which is basically from 2nd Street, uh, from Corona to Hillside. Get a lot of flooding in that area, especially the water ends up going on Temescal, uh, flooding a couple, some people there. It makes that turn towards the high school, so we're grabbing some of that water through that section there. That's currently in design, get close to being finished with the design. So we are pretty confident we can get it started in construction in the new fiscal year. Parmenter Park, the one Brian mentioned earlier, again, that's grabbing some of that flooding that occurs at the, at the base of the uh, frontage of the park, taking that water towards Temescal. We're pumping it basically over the hill to get it out of that area. That design is nearly done. Um, and then the South Snorkel Channel is a brand new project we're, we're looking at doing. It's a major project um, uh, as far as um, the second half of South Snorkel Channel, which is from um, the Hamner Avenue all the way south until it reaches the city of Corona's boundaries. Um, there are several areas in there where the uh, open channel, Colonel channel needs to be deepened, basically what they're doing to the South Nocle Channel project on the uh, uh, east side of the freeway. Uh, there's also other areas where we have potential to underground the piping, which would help benefit some of the property owners that currently have the water flow, surface flow through the back of their properties. So we're really interested in that. That'll benefit about seven or eight homes. Um, we still have to talk to property owners, see if they're interested, etc. But I did the work to talk to flood control. They're willing to fund that project, which is likely to be several million dollars. Um, and we've already engaged uh, one of um, flood control's pre-approved um, uh, design engineers, which is our one of our already pre-approved design engineers uh, that they're comfortable with, and they're currently reviewing that proposal to do that design work uh, right now to give us some feedback. So we've tentatively budgeted just the engineering um, at this time, and then because we imagine the engineering alone would be about a year of design. So we weren't even to come. We'll come back later on with actual construction costs, but they'll fund the whole project. And then uh, we have some basic catch uh, basin screens that we uh, need to do as part of the uh, new state requirements for the NPDES. You have to start putting in a certain percentage of catch screens inside your catch basins to capture material. And that's part of our process. It's the carrier project. We just didn't get a chance to start it yet. We have five years to show a certain percentage of increase in those catch screens. Uh, so this year we're going to try to make an effort of putting some sample catch screens in to see it works, what doesn't, talk with other agencies, what they've done, because some of the agencies have already started on this, so we get some benefit of their experiences, et cetera. But this will start in this process to, to get us in compliance to show the state that we've met some of those requirements of getting a certain number of catch screens into our basins. Uh, and that's our goals. Any questions on any particular project or? Go to. SB1. So as you know, we get funding uh, from SB1 from which is the uh, the gas tax. Um, so we did finish one project last year. So as you're aware of, which was the River Road, that was our 17-18 um, allocation that we got. Um, and then for this year's um, uh, project, we we didn't spend the money, uh, but I have projects here that will definitely spend that money and this year's money that we're getting for this next year. So we'll, we'll be in full compliance. So basically we're doing Hamner Avenue. I have two carryover projects, uh, which is the continued work on doing the um, the right hand turn pocket at 2nd Street at the I-15 and 6th Street at the I-15. We put a small amount of money in there just as a placeholder. We're really focusing on the other two projects, which is Hamner Avenue, 3rd Street to Hidden Valley, repaving that whole remainder of Hamner Avenue and getting that road now fully complete. And then Pedley Avenue, 7th Street to the riverbed, that is the joint project where once we put the storm drain in, we'll get the road all resurfaced. So we easily have two projects that will definitely get done this year and all the SB1 money will be accounted for and will be caught up. On, yeah, let's just say like on the Pedley Avenue project when so we have uh, with this rehab and overlay um, does that include any uh, horse trail uh, fencing when not in that project but it's a it's part of our recommended areas to put trail fencing in as part of the trail fund um, project okay but we didn't put it in this project with this specifically. It's a, a, a se separate project by itself as a whole as we do all the trail fencing. Okay. Uh, well, let me just throw this out, maybe not then to this specific one, but could, could we please 
when, when we have a project like this coming up that is going to include like new white vinyl fencing, that um, maybe we give our volunteers a chance to go in there and cherry pick some of the old wood railing mm -hmm. and posts uh, beforehand. So that way we can kind of build up our inventory for when the volunteers you know, replace wood fencing and sure. things like that. I think what we end up doing, because um, we've had experience in the past, is we'll probably just be doing um, a separate type of bid, do any of these trail fencing projects, because we usually get better pricing, as you pointed out. When we include these in individual projects, the pricing's not so good. Correct. Um, so. And when we do those projects, we will probably continue what we've done before, is do removals internally using our court crews or CRC, uh, our, uh, um, I'm sorry, Cal Fire crews. And what we'll do is when we pull those materials, because we have to dispose of them, we'll make them available for those groups to come pick through the piles. And that way they're not having to try to figure out what, what's good and dig it up themselves. Okay. Well, maybe that approach is better because I, I'll agree with you when the street contractor does it, that, that price goes. Right. Yeah. Good. Okay. Thank you. I'll go on to the next one which is Measure A. <clears throat> so on Measure A, even though we list a lot of, again, the five-year future where we might spend money, there's really only two projects with the, with the Measure A money that we're going to be spending. Um, the first one is Crestview Avenue. Again, it's moving forward and trying to finish the rest of Crestview uh, paving-wise, because we're going to finish a portion of the pavement between 6th and 7th as part of the NA1 storm drain project the flood control is doing. So we put in money to kind of pay, not to kind of pay, to pay from 6th Street to 7th Street, get that section done. Now we want to finish that road because the remainder of it is not good. And that goes from, and even though it says 6th Street to North Street, that's because some of the money that we will expend is coming out of this, which will pay flood control for that piece. We already have that cost, and then the remainder will be used to pave the rest of Crestview. So it does include that whole stretch, but it's two separate projects. One's underway, and one that we're going to finish. That design is almost done, It's and it's going to be ready to go out to bid very soon to do the street improvements. We just got a little bit of extra work to do with potholing, but we're going to go out pretty soon. But it is that whole section. And then the other project is Sierra Avenue, um, 6th Street to Detroit. Um, that's the street that I selected because it's a heavily trafficked road and it's incomplete. Um, there's three homes at the end where the um, curb and gutter didn't get included in, in that track project when it came in. Uh, so we're looking to finish that side. Um, and there's, a, there's one, two houses at the on the west side also that don't have curb and gutter. We'd like to finish off that road, put the curb and gutter in, clean it up. Um, certainly repave the road itself because it's under poor condition. Um, probably going to end up doing, um, we're trying to decide out whether we're going to go all the way through 6th Street so we get the intersection done because uh, it's pretty poor in the intersection, but especially on the cross gutters. Um, but it depends on how much the cost comes out to be, but our focus is between at least Sierra uh, to Det um, so on Sierra from 6 to Detroit. And, that, and that's uh, the, one, of the, one of the things we'd like to try to get done. Uh, Chad, uh, Norconian Drive. I thought that we were supposed to, it, it, was it pushed to 2021 or was it supposed to be 1920? Uh, originally, we had, were planning to, uh, a year ago, I was planning to bring this back at this time for this next fiscal year. Um, but additional information has come up in that it, I think it provides a prudent to make it wait another year until it, uh, this potential project that really right. could impact Norconian, i.e. paying for a good portion of those improvements. Right. And I would hate to repave the road and miss out on the opportunity for somebody to financially improve that road um, and take the cost um, rather than the city pay for it and the money can go somewhere else. Yeah, gotcha. And my understanding is that project is to the point where it's legitimately a potential project that will come forward in the near future to where we're not thinking it's a five-year window thing and nothing will ever get done. Um, I just want to make sure I'm prudently giving you all the information of why maybe we should wait versus doing something, but that was the only reason I pushed it another year. And, and you know, and it, for the other thing, candidly, it's staff's view is it's not a heavily trafficked street. I know it is a cut-through area and people do use it, but in relation to some of the other streets that we, we have urgent needs on, that wasn't one of the ones. I tell you that that's the road I hear about the most, and and I totally get about the project. I understand. So maybe Andy, in the next, you can maybe let us know what that project is, where it's at, because I've been there now with two projects that that didn't come through. 
Yeah. Requirement for a property owner to the west side also uh, to contribute towards uh, road improvements, and we are still negotiating with them in terms of determining what their uh, responsibility towards that is going to be. Are you talking so, about the church? Uh, yes. yes. So all of these needs to be uh, hashed out before we uh, uh, we can get some clarity in terms of. Uh, the timing for doing this project. So that's that's why we're showing. Right. I mean, that's a good reason. I just want to make sure if that's the case, we have to get it out there because it is the one I hear about the most. And I like your explanation if somehow we can make sure people understand that there's a way for the taxpayer not to pay for it. And by delaying it, um, we may get a developer to come in who will take care of a good portion of it and save a lot of money. Yeah. Did I say that correctly? No. Okay. <clears throat> Kevin, I'm going to agree with you on that because even though we we do hear about it, Narconian Drive, and yes, it is a cut through, but when you think about all what's going on on Fifth Street and along with the new development there, if it takes some pressure off of Hamner between Fifth and Sixth Street, it would be a blessing. So I would like to make sure that that is heavily prior, prioritized and to see where so-called the whatever happens uh it stays there for the 2021 we need to get it fixed thank you storm uh, drain project associated with norconian drive also we looked at it. one of the main things we asked. I asked more time for initially because I was looking at potential water line project, a potential recycled water line there, whether a storm drain project would be viable and be helpful through that area. Um, the water line's not an issue. The recycled water certainly is not an issue. Um, we looked at whether a it, it's really like capturing water from the hillside, and if a development came in, they'd capture all that okay. water. Right. So we we would if. If, let's say if no development occurs and we're just going to move forward doing the road, we would look at a at reconstructing the under drain that's currently there and not very very functional to try to capture that water to take it down the course it okay. should go so it doesn't flood out on a routine basis. But nothing with the county? No. Okay. Thank you. Chad and I, I'm going to jump on Newton's thing. Did we ever find out what that drain was that's already there behind the church and where that went? Are you talking to one that's to the... It's the, it, I'm sure the, it's at the southwest corner. corner of the property. That would be correct. Yeah, that's part of the under drain that should, that's that's on the other side of uh, Norconian, uh, which you can't find. So it's been buried, and it's supposed to take water from the other side of the road across and then discharge on that side of the property and go through the property. As I recall, two years ago we looked at we found it there because it rained and it washed it out, and there, there it was, there like a, a, a basin mm -hmm. that was done there, and it looked like it had a concrete cap on it, and no one could tell me where it went or where the water goes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's where the and good staff looked at that and our understanding is that, that it was an under drain that goes under the road meant to grab the water from the low point take it to the other side um, but my understanding is over the years it's been backfilled and on both sides so that it won't be a problem <laughs> for the property owner <laughs> we, we may want to check somewhere to see where that drain actually yes. goes and that's the whole point is we really want to Thank fix you. that whole issue overall No other questions on those items. We'll go to trail improvements. Okay, so uh, we updated this slide. Um, previously, it just indicated various locations. Uh, we did meet with the um, Street Trails Use Commission. I think I'd previously given you kind of the list showing what we talked about. We developed two different lists. Um, we find it's it's far more usable to have the primary list things we'd like to achieve and have secondary lists if we have to shift because like we learned this last year on uh, uh, Stetson, there are utilities in the way and um, we couldn't put the trail fencing in uh, as we planned to with the contractor because it was all hand digging and they weren't about to do that. But we just shifted and did some other areas. So we're, we're creating a list of primary and then secondary projects. Um, we don't have specific costs for each um, 
section of uh, roadway that we've identified here. I, I've simply looked at the overall linear fit, linear footage between all these roadways and guessed them, and based off of that, we determine that the total amount that we're planning to ask for, the 150,000 plus the measure R money, which is a different discussion, um, will give us enough money to do the roads we have listed here to add vinyl fencing. And the reason these particular ones were chosen is, um, and I encouraged in, into the Stuck Commission, is that these are roads that we've already finished as far as paving. So our goal is let's finish the trail. Let's go through, do any clear and grubbing we need to do on the trail, take out the old fencing, level it off, compact it, and then put the nice white vinyl fencing in so we have a complete nice new road. Let's not jump around to roads that really the trails that don't have the road that's eventually going to need to improve, let's clean up those roads that have a finished product. So this will get us caught up to the roads that we just recently finished or are finishing now. Um, and then we'll continue that pattern for the next roads that we do on this next budget year. But we already have a list of other secondary ones that aren't necessarily getting any road improvements that would the commission would like to see if money becomes available. But this at least takes care of a lot of those roads we spent time and money on uh, to make nice and finishing the trail, I think, would really make it look sharp. So that was our motivation of how we selected these particular streets. On your selection of streets, Kevin, when did they repave and fix the flood control channel in front of your house? Nine. It's been, but it's nine years old. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I'm, I'm only saying this because when you look at the improvements on a street, most of that wooden rail was replaced on your side there and fixed. But if you look well, if you look at it today, it looks like that thing is a disaster. And, and here's my point: the easement on the other side in the in the spacing on that trail fence, it's too close to the road for one. But the other problem is. And this goes back to, I guess we have to do some parking enforcement, is people that park perpendicular there and back into that trail fence, we need to start looking at the easement in our space. How much are we going to give? If you look at the east side easement of that, and I'm just, I'm making the suggestion when you pick these streets out that how do we preserve the fence that we put in? And his street, and the one that runs along Pedley, because that storm drain, they replace a lot of it. But unfortunately, because it's too close to the road, a lot of it gets hit. It, it, and, and that, and because we allow people to park perpendicular in that area, because the easement is so far, if you look at where they put the storm drain, it's at least, it's car width. You can, I mean, not even width, I mean length. At 15, 20 feet. And these people use in that area just a perpendicular park. And it's not just that. I just know that street. They're backing into the fence. So when we look at this, let's look at they traffic. They said they aren't. Huh? They said they aren't. They're not backing into your fence? Yeah. Okay. I have to be quiet. Yeah. Uh, my point is, let's look at these streets, not just the fence, but let's look at how the traffic is going and the protection of this fence. And if it's a, because of a, a, we're allowing things to happen, uh, driving habits, bad driving habits, maybe we need to look at how much easement property we have. Right. When we, we say replacement. Maybe yeah. the... And we could certainly look and, and work with um, law enforcement to determine whether, what our options are as far as um, restricting the type of parking, whether or not it, I, I honestly don't know whether you can restrict whether somebody parks perpendicular versus parallel, or if we could say parallel parking only, only. Those types of things certainly would help, and we could put up the signage well, that I don't, resolves that. I don't think it's illegal to park perpendicular to the street. Yeah, I, 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 it's, I've never had proposed that question as far as in relation to the it, the impacts of it because people backing up, you know, into the trail fencing. But because of that area, because when we put the storm drain in, we made it easier for them to do that. And I mean, you know, you've been here long enough. The folks are parking on our easements and taking over our easements, putting fences in their own landscaping in the easement, and those are problems that we need to adjust. Right. But that area in particular has gotten bad. And it's not just there, I just know it because I, but the one on, uh, that, what is it, fifth in Temescal? They park, they park perpendicular and they keep backing into the stuff. Mm. So when you go and replace these fences, 
just don't look at OK Street. Let's look at traffic patterns and what's going on to those fences. That's just my point. No, and we do. I and mean, for example, on Pedley, in front of the in, in is it Riverview School up Elementary, um, we're actually shifting the parking so it's not on the east side any or west east side east side of the road anymore. It's on the west side. So we're widening a little bit, taking out the exist some of the existing curb on the school side so people park there we're going to shift the roadway so there's more space on that side and there's going to be no parking at all in front of the new trail fencing that is going to be in front of the school or along the area because it just keeps getting hit so that whole section we're simply going to say no parking so we've we're aware of those kind of situations but that's something i wasn't aware of as far as how they were doing the constant backing up i think maybe kevin had mentioned to me one time before um describing his his frustration of his fence is always getting knocked down. But uh, but we are do try to look at that, so I appreciate the feedback. That's another area we should look at and how we can maybe increase the life of our, our hard work. Ted, are you referring also to where, let's say we have the street and then the storm drain is set back like 10 feet and then there's a paved area to channel to the storm drain? Yeah, Lieutenant's going to love this one. We have Bob's. Remember when we did that storm drain there on Corona Avenue? The, the drug house right there. I thought that was their private parking stall. He parks right off Corona Avenue, right in front of that storm drain, and then they go in and out of the house and they leave. So we have the same situation on off of Corona. You've been there. <laughs> I think we should put signage there. Just no parking. I, I yeah I don't know. I'm something else to look at and talk okay. about. I'm not sure. I'll have you come by. You can see it. it this might be. I don't want to belabor the, the topic, but this might be something that. Public Works, admin, and the Sheriff's Department can look at. Uh, as far as I know, there is no perpendicular parking, but without, in, in our specifically in our code, we need to look at it and address it. Because I think that is part of our problem as we get more and more people, and especially with our deep lots, and they're narrow, is that folks will take any advantage possible to park. And, you know, that's, let's face it, it's right down the corner, is it, I keep saying it's 15, Temescal, in front of that little house with the, I'm trying to think what it is, the uh, dinosaur. I mean, they're the whole, they just perpendicular park all over. And they take up a lot of space. But it, what I'm getting at is it's destroying the fence. Mm. So if you could yeah. just get together in one of your meetings and put your heads together. Sure. Come up with something we can support. Absolutely. Thank you. All right, so we'll go into water improvements. So there's a lot of activity planned for this next fiscal year, and it, and it, it assumes um, obtaining um, bond revenues to do um, multiple projects that are necessary in the city and, and critical. Um, but I'll go through those projects real quick. So it includes um, repairing the water line that's on Chestnut. Um, that Chestnut blew up twice on us right after we paved it. Uh, so that's an old uh, pipeline that we need to replace. Smaller projects can continue replacing uh, old, outdated hydrants. We're still always updating the GIS and uh, the asset management system. Um, the uh, Looking at a new water line as far as uh, over the Hamner Avenue Bridge, um, and that is basically uh, initially just a part of the, I put 50,000, but that's really the second year, uh, and it likely is gonna get pushed until they actually um, bill us, which is probably not going to be until 2022, 23. This is for the new water line that we're having a, that's going to be through the new Hamner Bridge. Um, so we've just placed marks some dollars there, but likely it's going to get pushed each year until we just haven't been told yet when they might actually start billing us during the project. They're not going to start construction until 2021, the end of 21, 22. Um, so, but this is a place mark to kind of let you know big dollar items that we have coming that need to be, we need to make sure we have money there for. Um, and we have uh, a Hillside Avenue water line uh, project. That's not until next year, uh, but it's a critical one in that I can't, one of the Hillside Avenue itself 
is a road I really want to repave through that section, but the water line is so shallow that we'll literally hit all the services once we go down 12 inches. It's that bad. So I can't do the street until I do this. So it's it's I have to do one before the other. So this is a critical one. Again, it's not till the future year, and it will be dependent on, on monies overall available, but I just want to give you an idea that is a, a project that's coming forward in the near future. The biggest one for us, I'm sorry. Yes, that's very old. It's like from the, just after 46, is, could it be that old? I'm not sure I wasn't there. Oh. Shut up. <laughs> uh, our biggest project, certainly by far, that we have planned is trying to move forward with our new reservoir and booster station. Um, it's currently in the redesign. Um, it's it's We've gotten the um, first draft of that. I'm currently reviewing that. Uh, certainly the engineer's estimates come down a lot lower uh, with our revisions that we've done. So we do feel confident that it'll be a project that will move forward. So we'll hopefully go back in the, near for, in the near future uh, to get that out back to bid. Uh, but that is our line item. And I'm certainly hoping we are well below that $5 million mark, but that's just my safety valve. I'm really gearing and hoping for that 4 million sweet spot to really get everything we need. Uh, worst case scenario, I simply go with one reservoir, one booster station, move on, and it gets done no matter what. But we, we need to get it done. It's a it's a companion project that's going with our treatment plant that we're currently uh, working on right now. The next other big major project is, again, storage. It's our reservoir uh, number one. Um, that one has already been designed. It's been designed for two years. Uh, we had to shelve it because of lack of dollars. Um, yeah, we already do have the engineer's estimate. It's $4 million. Um, likely, we'll do some revisions to that project before we ever go out, similar to what we're doing with the reservoir project we just did. So we have companion uh, comparison reservoirs that get some benefit of cost savings that we designed in this, this reservoir 8 and 9. So that number, hopefully, again, will come down or be within that number and it'll be good, but that's uh, reservoir number one is up off of uh, Pas Pas uh, it's hill it's hillside and El, El Paso. It's up on that hill. Uh, it's basically increasing the reservoir from a two million gallon to a three million gallon reservoir to get more capacity. It's a very old reservoir. It's, le it's leaching um, uh, water as we speak. Nothing significant, but it's just it's just old. It's concrete. It needs, and it's already uh, it, it's already gone it's past its useful life. So that's definitely an important one we want to do. Uh, a future one again with bond money is reservoir number two. It is the same sister reservoir. It's already got problems. We've already replaced its its vent before. It completely corroded out. We just sent you a report that the uh, hatch completely corroded out, and we're having to replace that. Um, but again, that's a project that is desirable to do, but it doesn't mean those funds will go to that. We're just kind of highlighting where we're at. We're focused on the year one projects. Uh, then we have again, continued skative improvements, uh, South Noco Channel, Third Street, Waterline relocations. These have been on here for several years because this is related to the South Norco um, storm drain project that the um, flood control is going to do at some point when they move forward we have to do some water relocations and this is basically holding that money there to do those relocations with the help of a contractor um, it's just been several years this has been on there and then we, we always keep an eye on a certain amount of money for unspecified waterline projects a lot of times goes for design for stuff we've now realized we need to do or replace emergency replacements such as this what we had to do on Crestview this is the type where that money gets used uh, when we need those emergency work done. And we always have plenty of valve installations. We have a lot of old valves. We in, in, uh, allocate $100,000 for that. And then we have a continuation item, which is the water treatment plant upgrade, which is $2 million. And that is expected to be done by September um, and, is, and is moving forward fairly well. And then we have a continuation item where we uh, well rehab on well 12, 14, and 15. Uh, we're going to be certainly looking right now, especially with the treatment plant be getting ready is doing some minor rehab and improvements on some of our wells that are going to deliver water to that treatment plant. So we're up and ready to go when that treatment plant is ready. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. California to Crestview. Okay. How old is that, that line? I thought that was relatively new. North Avenue, California to Crestview. Yeah, you have North Avenue, oh, uh, California to Crestview. That is related to, we just got the emergency connection from the Riverside County. Uh, I'm not Riverside, uh, City of Riverside. So with that connection, it's a 1500 GPM connection. Our pipeline is only a six. In order to get that much water and, and get the full its benefits, I need to replace the line from north to California. California is a 10 inch line. So if I replace it, 
with a 10 inch line, I can now get the full benefit of that water, which is cheaper than our other imported water sources. So that was a desirable project. It doesn't mean we're gonna do it. For right now, it's an emergency connection. When we get the agreement for full-time water deliveries, the capacity is 1500 GPM. At best, I'll be able to get 700 uh, into our system because of our pipe constrictions. Because they're put in a 10 inch line, we're going into a six, and then it finally gets to our 10 inch line down farther. So to really get that full capacity, it's a desirable project. That's why I put it several years out. It's not a critical one. Uh, and we'll evaluate it when we get closer to that. But that's, that's the problem with the connection right now, it's just the restrictions. Well, a couple of my, my, my concerns with that is, one here recently, we just finished all the improvements, California and North. And the, the other was, this is part of the trade-off with the, the city of Riverside to give up the nursery and the cemetery, correct? That we would then, they would then allow us that water connection? I don't view it as a trade-off. It, it really wasn't one contingent or the other, in staff's mind. It was, it was, this was something well, I, I was seeking to get water reliability. But that, that's the same, that's where the, the source of that connection is, right? That's the point of connection? Right, it's at that corner. Correct. And the reason I use the word trade-off is because in previous reports, when you talked about that agreement with Riverside, that the revenues that we lost in water sales to the nursery and the cemetery would be offset by savings uh, that, that we would incur in the future. So it was kind of a trade-off. It was gonna be a, a basically a push situation. Um, and, and I remember that very well because I didn't support it. Well, now that, because I remember that very closely. Well, I think what those I had, revenues, I think that what loss I had, of revenue is going to be offset by the savings. I think. Well, I think what we, if I recall correctly, what I said is it's not. It's offset by we having to purchase less imported water from Arlington um, to give those customers. So we're basically reducing our overall demand on Arlington. Right, but nowhere is, in that conversation, when we had that conversation, did did this come up and say, oh, by the way, we're going to need another. Four hundred thousand dollars to make the connection all the way down to California Avenue. I again, I we never us, have talked about. No, that. I don't think we ever have. Again, it was right. part of our evaluation. For me, I need the emergency connection because, regardless of what my restrictions are, I needed the emergency connection. There was no other place to put it. So that is the point of connection. Regardless, what we've determined in that whole process and in, in design of it was that. You know, in order to effectively use it the, the best way possible, I need to increase our pipeline that goes from Arlington down to California in order to maximize. Otherwise, I will forever limit myself to just about 700 GPM, which we can. It just limits our ability to get as much water as we can at that particular price. And that's just a restriction that I can't eliminate because there's, I couldn't make them connect somewhere else. This is the connection point because that's where our two cities meet. I guess that's my fault for not asking that question that what's the next step? One thing always constitutes something else, but we never had the discussion that we're gonna need another $400,000 once we made that deal. Thank and again, it's not something we, if, they, if it's the council's desire, we don't have to do it. It's just we're not using the connection um, to its full potential to benefit Norco. Thank you. Any other questions on the water projects? Okay. Go to sewer. So on the sewer, we're certainly going to start ramping up the work that we're planning on doing. A lot of it's related to lift stations. Uh, we're really going to spend time with hiring consultants to look at our, our lift stations uh, as a whole. Uh, we have several that need to be upgraded some that need to be replaced. A lot of them just need upgrades uh, into how they operate. We're, we're trying to move from above ground to submersible pumps and their efficiencies that we've been doing the last couple of years. Um, that's what we did with um, uh, 9 and uh, 10, um, excuse me, not 9 and 10, um, uh, Valley View and, uh, and the Corona lift station. 
So we've most of these are those. We have a carryover project, which is the 27-inch um, main line that goes under the freeway from second to third. That line is currently, again, um, almost fully impacted uh, with the amount of, uh, of use that it gets. We really want to add a secondary line to go through there um, and, uh, if, and also bigger line, but we need to get the design done. We didn't engage that this year. We're focused on, on a couple other projects, so we're going to start that this year and engage a consultant. That's the original 250 that we're guesstimating as far as to um, their cost to look at that project. It's going to be heavily involved with Caltrans, so it's going to be a long bureaucratic process as far as dealing with them. So uh, unfortunately, I do not even have a clean guesstimate of what it would cost. So we've thrown in a number in there we thought hopefully covers us, uh, to be frank. So um, that $250,000. And again, the placeholder for construction in future years, again, it's our guesstimate based off of what we need to be done or what it likely would cost. But again, we'll know more and those numbers will be adjusted in future years. But we need to do that first year and doing the design. But then we have, uh, we put basically put placeholders for basic design. I, I expect when we, we go out with these each of these projects, we're going to get bids that are going to be um, done cumulatively. So we're going to get some economies of scale. Uh, even though I've indicated these individual numbers, I think overall a lot of this money will not be included in the actual bids because they're getting more work. They're going to, it's going to cost less. But that's why I see a lot of these numbers are the same. Their placeholders almost. This is my my belief and what I've experienced is that if I was doing individually, this is what it would cost. But if we do them as pairs or three or four at a time, based off the type of potential upgrade or it's a replacement type projects together, we'll get some efficiencies. So I think there'll be savings overall once we finally bring these to you to bid. But almost all of these are all relation to our, our lift stations, which carry the sewage to the next uh, through to the force main and, and out of the city. On that first page, the second page. It uh, again continuous gate of improvements. Um, again, look at design. Uh, we looking at a new uh, main on Shadow Canyon, eight inch uh, main line replacement. So we need to get the design done. And then we have uns we, these are just some placeholders. We have unspecified lift station rehab. Realistically, uh, we have from time to time we've had major replacements or uh, pumps that we had replaced. That's the only time we use this uh, those dollars. We do definitely do year to year unspecified manhole rehabilitation. Terry's always definitely using that money for his issues with our manholes getting eaten up and destroyed um, in, in, in their normal wear and tear. And then unspecified sewer line extensions. Sometimes, again, we get issues with customers where um, uh, we were supposed to, um, or excuse me, we have to fix their sewer because um, the plants, trees destroyed it. Those are on us to repair when it's us. These are the funds we look to to, to fix that segment of pipe. We hire TK and they come in or, or CP where we're con online contract, online on-call contractor is and we use those funds to do those as we need to do them during the year. Um, versus which is a different item which is a different fund. One, I think it's 148. There's money there for sewer line extensions. That's mainly in guided for um, when, as you know, we had all these uh, sewer um, uh, development districts where we put in main lines and put laterals to properties, etc. In some cases, the laterals didn't get put in, even though they should have. We'll use those monies to pay for that work that we do. We'll have a contractor put it in, take it to the property line, and then the resident does that. We haven't had one since I've been here, but that's mainly what they're there for. So there's a little difference as far as when we go in and do a lateral and, and which funds are used to do that, just so you're aware. And then we have RICRA, Recycled Water Capital Improvements. This is the estimate from RICRA as far as what they're going to bill us for uh, site improvements for the next fiscal year. Uh, so that's directly from them. And, and then they and to keep that in mind, they will only bill that for the project if it actually comes before and is awarded. So if they don't get it, they just won't ask for all that full amount of money. Any questions on any of those other projects? I have a quick question. Um, what's the lifespan on a lift station? Because like I see Oldenburg on here and I feel like that neighborhood's relatively new. So what's the average li lifespan on those? It, honestly, it depends on the wear and tear. It's use, it depends how it was originally designed. Um, there's a lot of factors that we look at. I mean, it, if it was designed very well, it should last no problem. Some of this, it, that far as upgrade, could simply be, again, going to submersible pumps, which are more efficient and effective uh, to use for us than, than uh, above-ground pumps. 
And so that's what we're going to look at to find out. And we look at all these, what improvements need to be done so we can, and, and, and what level are they required? And that's what we're going to come back and explain what we're doing and why and the rationale. Because a lot of these, we're not looking to replace the station. We're just doing an upgrade. So, well, in the, in the book, like, for example, on 109 Old Hamner, you say you're going to change the lift station to a submersible pump. So that makes sense. But, like, Oldenburg lift station, for example, you have replace of current lift station. And that neighborhood up there <coughs> isn't that old. So does so that mean that one's... So Oldenburg's on page 110, like the specifics oh, the, on the oh, full sorry. yeah document. Um, because you put, for the most part, explanations of everything. But, you know, if you tell yeah, me it's here. typically, you know, 10 years or 12 years or whatever the case may be. But when I saw that one, for example, that's up in the hills, that's not old, in right. my opinion. So. And, and you're absolutely right. Like I said, we'll come back in 18 and make sure that we justify whatever we're proposing to do and i apologize i don't have all the details oh, okay. and all these but i again we're not about to just do something cosmetically because we want to it's going to have a reason for it and i fully expect um, this council to grill me on that when it comes forward okay well can you answer a question then like valley view and corona we just put those in what's your expectation of lifetime on those then the pumps themselves well the station itself the way it was built If you continually do routine maintenance and uh, upkeep, that's the key thing, because mm -hmm. uh, you do get wear and tear on your tanks and equipment. So if you're in doing proper maintenance, uh, at some point, I'd say at least 15 years in, you're going to at least do some sort of general repair, whether it's replacing your pumps entirely, uh, any type of of significant patching you may need to do on, on the internal tanks. Depends on the material they were done. Like I said, new material now, they're made to last quite a long time. If it's an old concrete tank, uh, they don't last long. The, the, the gases inside there just eat it away. Um, that's why a lot of our um, replacements when it comes to manholes, they're done with epoxy coatings, etc., because they just handle the gases a little bit better than a uh, concrete that was done in the past. There's too many uh, pores in the concrete for it to get in and start just tearing away. Um, so a lot of it's about maintaining it the right way. Um, in general, your station should last you about 40 years. Okay. I mean, without, but if you, if you maintain them right way, you do routine equipment replacement, your station itself should not need to be replaced, you know, in that regard, in my opinion. Okay, so then on Oldenburg, there's some serious situation or a flaw then and that and that's what i'll opinion? verify okay. yeah I'll, i will verify that i apologize for not having the specifics on that one okay thank you yes sir uh, on, on all of these that you'll be going out are you going to be using consultants correct and working with staff to go to each site evaluate it staff identifying what are the actual concerns so they can outline them for me so we can look at it and say okay do we really need to replace this does this have to be converted can this just be retrofitted what are we doing here what's the overall condition and what are we trying to achieve you know i don't want to get into well i thought we could just replace it no no if it's still usable and good and it's okay and it's good technology this is what we should be doing well more of my question was that you said that you're going to use consultants on this. Is this you're going to go out to our preferred list of design engineers to bid and that you will bid this Correct. for the oh, design? Absolutely. Yeah, Every, everybody will be submitting proposals. Okay, the professional services, absolutely. And then it'll be like uh, you and Terry, let's say, going out and evaluating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, staff would internally evaluate those proposals okay. to find out experience. You know, certainly we're going to be asking for uh, quite a bit of um, documentation of their experience with doing lift station upgrades, rehabs, replacements. We want to make sure who's doing that is has experience, but is economically reasonable in what they're propos proposing to do. Okay, because unfortunately, some of our contractors are a little bit um, they're expensive. Good ones are. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, sir. So, 
so this is that um, sewer connection, other fund, 148, basically it's, it's pretty much remained stagnant. This is where we go to put those laterals in. Um, if and when we had not determined, we, sh we did not put a lateral in way back when that should have been in, this is what those funds will be commonly be used for. And then we have street fund, 149. So on this one, um, we have our first line item, which is striping. Um, this is just general money from then if, if we need striping, um, which is different than our striping contract where we have just striping done all year long. Um, we have various slurry still locations. We didn't specify where they are because we're trying to determine where we're going to do this. We've determined, we started last year where we really focused on doing slurry seals to preserve the streets while they're still good. Um, we want to continue this on a continuous basis every year, um, recognizing that the future years are going to be a lot less significant as far as cost. So we want to focus on about 150, 160,000 a year um, and then find out where we can do those two. We're, and we're currently looking at that as far as neighborhood areas um, that are fairly new or the newest ones that we, that, that slurry seal is applicable. Again, we'll come back overall and say, here's, here's the projects that we propose, here's why, um, and here's the streets that we're going to do that for. But right now we just listed it as various locations because we'd like to continue that type of treatment. It really benefits us overall to keep our, our good streets in a good condition. So Hamner Abner widening, third street to fifth street, that's a carryover project from this year. It was already awarded to a, uh, to a contractor. They're likely going to start at the end of this month um, or early July. Well, those are all tough funded, tump funded, uh, it's a tough tump funded project. Um, and again, that was already awarded and that's upgrading a couple of those properties, about nine of them along Hamner between third and, and fifth. Yes, sir. That'll get rid of those uh, places along the street that hang out into the lanes, right? It'll get to a couple of them. Some of them will, weren't, some of the properties weren't willing to give us the dedications required. Um, so those, certain properties will not be done. Okay, what about down on this end by J&M towing and everything? Is all that going to be removed and widened down through there? Between, uh, except for the corner? where the restaurant is and the auto place, those are not being widened because we couldn't get those dedications, but everything south of there uh, is. That we got those dedications, all that will be widened and cleaned up. Well, I thought they had that years ago, that dedication, because the way it was set up, you're going to walk out that restaurant door right into a car. Yeah, it, like I said, we don't have the dedication. We've, we've met with the property owner and, and their representatives, and unfortunately, they were not interested in providing those dedications. Okay, without. well, that is some more lawn fertilizer that we were fed one time. I, I'm sure they would entertain that idea. My ability in that discussion was limited in that there was no money from Tump to do that. Um, so my discussions never got to a dollar amount or figure. Um, what we focused on was the savings for them as a property if the city did the work, you know, because they'd have to do the widening of themselves that they develop, they'd have to change the intersection and the signals at that 5th and Hamner, which is a substantial cost. So if we did it on their behalf, um, those improvements would already be done and, I, I, and we view it as a benefit to the property. They didn't, um, which is okay, I understand, um, but we tried to, uh, to e emphasize the importance of the project that way, plus it also provides safety once it's widened, um, and we accommodated them in the design that we did, because we did a full design so they could see it. Um, they didn't lose any parking, um, it, it was a safe and, um, process, a sidewalk in front of them, they weren't, you're not walking out the door and you're in the street, they were, it, it actually looked very nice. Um, it's just something they just didn't want to move forward with. You had said uh, these on Hamner when Berwin mentioned J and M that that's tump fees. Mm -hmm. So I guess note to Gina, if you and your staff would would you give a little report, just later written report, uh, J and M towing paid cash and lieu fees for those improvements. It, it, it's been longer than 20 years. Oh, yeah. That money's been sitting in. 
cash in lieu accounts. So if you could just. Account that is at the local bank somewhere. Yeah, I mean, it goes back to Jim Daniels' yeah. days. So, but I, I think, well, at least for myself and maybe all of us, how will that be transferred around and how that that moves? We'll get that back to you. Thank you. So the. Um, Next project is, is a continuation project, which is Second Street on the right-hand turn pocket onto the I-15. Again, as you know, we've been working on it for quite a while. Um, keep creeping closer through Caltrans, hoping sometime in July that maybe they actually give me the green light. But um, we're we're waiting on them. But again, it's a it's a project I'm really hoping for that we actually get a construction this next year. But we'll see. Um, then we have Second Street sidewalk project um, northbound. Um, this is actually not a new project per se, but it's new in, in it wasn't listed previously in last year's budget item. We added it in your mid-year budget this year. You guys approved that project because it included $250,000 grant from um, Caltrans, which we did get that money already. So this is the carryover funds. They are basically, just so you understand, they're, they're projected to finish that work, uh, our portion of the work, which is the sidewalk portion, um, Probably by, by the end of June, early July, but it's not going to be 100% finished because the poll that they're supposed to put in is not going to get here till about September. So that's how long they're waiting in the queue for that poll. So we're holding X amount that we're not going to pay them, obviously, uh, for the project because the poll and that work hasn't been done. But majority of the work will be set up and billed by June. This is carryover dollars that we expect to, at some point, expand in the first quarter. But they, what they're so you understand is when they're done with that project, including the off ramp, which I believe is supposed to be done with the off ramp project by the end of July, it'll all be open. There'll be a existing pole there, placed in temporary status, and then they'll take the old pole when it comes in and put the new one in. But everything will be up and running. Sidewalk will be able to use, etc. There will be nothing impeding pedestrians or vehicles. So that'll be all, it won't be waiting for that to be reopened until until September. Then we have the 6th Street, I-15 again, right turn pocket, just in that beginning processes with, with Caltrans. We're on our second submittal with them. Again, we'll see how that goes uh, in regulation to get anywhere. Uh, Hamner Avenue, um, again, this is 3rd Street to Hidden Valley. Um, I have two funding sources for that, as you mentioned before. I had SB1, but I also have this funding here. It's been estimated to be almost 900 to a million bucks to, to do all that paving. So that's why I have two sources for funding. Um, and part of that use. Then I have Vine Street, Corridon um, uh, to, uh, to Bronco, uh, from, excuse me, from Corridon to Bronco, Driftwood, Half Moon. This is that project where we pulled out from um, the water project and now we're ready to go back to it. That project's already basically been designed. We're getting ready to go back out to bid to get that finished uh, for those residents there. And we, we do appreciate their patience on that. And then we have reconstruction. We have Del Mar between Corridor and Avenue Kipps Corner. Uh, that's a new project. Um, then we have the traffic signals that um, project, two projects, which is the dual left hand turns off Hamner from second uh, and also to six. Those are in combination with the right turn projects. Those are again uh, placeholders again until we get the um, funding, uh, funding the go ahead from Caltrans. But once we do, those are fundings for that specific portion of work that needs to be done. Um, there may be. Just so you know, and we're already aware of it, depending on project timing, the money that is for the traffic signal, a hammer to Second Street, two hundred thousand. Since I already have funding expected between Hamner, uh, excuse me, Hidden Valley and Third, that whole section. If I go forward with that first, that will include those improvements that would likely be needed for the left turn lane, and then these funds would not end up being used because it's, it's a question of making sure in the end I don't repeat a process and then you're questioning me why on earth did we do this. Um, so they are, I do recognize that's in the same sphere of influence, we're not gonna be doing it twice. But it, it's they're listed as separate projects for that purpose though. Because they originally started as separate projects but I wanna make sure that I'm keenly aware of that's a kind of a double dip there. In the end, what I'm trying to do is get them both at the same time. <laughs> so it gets all done at once. But I can't really put in those improvements on Hamner 
if the improvement on Second Street isn't done. That's my logistical problem. Otherwise, I have to go to the potential of putting in dual light lanes and basically blacking them the, the one lane out and have to come back and stripe it later, which is not a bad thing. It just creates a little bit of confusion for folks, but that's one way of ensuring that the ultimate striping is already done, pavement's already done, et cetera. And, and myself and the city engineer are looking at that, figuring out if Second Street's not ready, how do we want to finish this so it's just all done? Okay, and then the last one there is uh, the, the residential street sign replacement. This is the phase three of our sign replacement, now getting into the residential signs, putting the new poles up or adding poles that simply don't exist, putting the cross signs, uh, new residential street signs up so that people know where they're at. Uh, a lot of them are faded, fallen down, broken off. So now this is going back and finally putting those signs up since we've already done the overhead signs or finishing the overhead signs now uh, through the city. This is that, that third and final phase that we're looking at trying to complete. I have a quick question. Delmar, reconstruct. That street currently has speed bumps. As per what we've passed, is it correct that those will not be replaced? They won't. Okay. On Del Mar. So then we get to take the heat over that after that happens. Okay. Because that's what we said, gosh, less than a year ago, I feel like, or maybe a year, a year and a half ago. ago. So. Yeah, it was at the time that it, when any street that has existing um, speed humps, uh, when a street gets redone, those speed humps would not be put back in because you remove them to do that work, but they would not be put back in. I, I think we need to relook at this because I know public safety's opinion on it, but it, those speed bumps were put in for a specific reason, and that's because a kid got killed there, right? If you remember. And we're going to take a tremendous amount of heat if you reconstruct that street and there isn't speed tables or speed humps put back in. I'd almost tell you don't do the street and strike it out because we'll, we'll take a beating if they don't go back in. Yeah, how do they, uh, how, how do you get by without putting them back in? They've been there for over 25 years that I know of. Because as part of the ordinance that the city council elected to adopt, it put a ban on uh, speed hump speed tables, and in that discussion, in, in, in that review was that if any any of these existing, because there was only two at the time, I believe it was, uh, is it Corona? Corona and has one, speed tables. Speed tables, and then uh, um, Del Mar, and I think the only one the recent that you allowed in was the recent construction on Sundance. Um, and we basically indicated that in the future, any road replacement would eliminate putting the speed humps back in or speed tables back in, whatever was existing. Uh, because again, we're, we're redoing the road, putting in compliance at the, at, which is now the current standard, which is no speed hump speed tables. <laughs> That's why we wouldn't put it back in because it's not currently allowed. I'm like Greg, we're gonna catch a lot of devil over that one, so. Well, just to clarify, you, we, we catch the devil already because we won't put them in other places and, and they got them or they got them. So I think regardless, you're gonna get the grief because other people want them because other people have them. So I think either way, we'll certainly get the grief, but I understand that the, those residents themselves will be probably very upset and then not realizing that that is something that's going to occur. It's gonna be more than upset. Well, so, uh, for the lieutenant and the chief that, and, and I don't know if there's any way that maybe you could help us with this, in past history, if those speed bumps have been there, let's say, 25 years? At least. Okay. At, at any point for a call for service, has those, those specific speed bumps on Del Mar delayed a response time? I mean, is that, I mean, could you even, for law, it's not an issue. The speed humps are an issue for us. They don't delay us. Uh, um, our vehicles are not nearly the size of the fire trucks. 
so they, they can absorb a lot more uh, impact with the speed going over them. I've only been here in Norco a year. I would definitely want to gather, before making a decision either way, I would want to gather more information. Um, as the LTs said, the, the fire engines are heavy fire apparatus that we have to slow down or, or we would have we would create other challenges for ourselves and the fire engine. Uh, as far as damage to the vehicle, um, gear uh, coming off the engine. So there's a whole lot of items. We, we can definitely, um, through our CAD, um, run some drills and put in, um, but it's going to take some staff work, but I, in, my, in this particular case, I think well worth it that we, we come up with an informed decision because we we have to live with, with the decision we make, and if we whether we take, uh, take them out, leave them in, I would want to make sure we have everything on the table so we make a good informed de decision. Uh, if the speed bumps are in, a, as we know, there potentially could be a delay in response, so it's the the level of service we want to ensure we provide and in our line of work um, response times is everything and we want to make sure we don't leave anything on the table that wasn't uh, gone through and vetted out. No, I appreciate that chief and you know, maybe we could look at a modification of those two where we cut wheelbase open or something like that if we had to reconstruct the street. So I think we'd all be open to new and better ideas but I, I agree with the mayor and Berwin that we're going to take a beating bad. <laughs> if I can interject, Chief, because neither one of you guys were here, the recommendation of that ordinance when we did remove them was based upon the recommendation from Cal Fire or the fire, County Riverside County Fire Chief that they would not support the uh, application or uh, putting in any speed tables, speed bumps, speed humps, whatever else you want to call them. That was the recommendation of your your chief at the time. So that is what we did, why we did it. And basically they would not approve of them and they were the chief safety officers for us. So uh, this is going to go probably back to your administrators as their application instead of making a blanket thing that they would not support it. So I guess it's going to go back to see what your new chief says because that was under the old guy. So, and that might be something that Andy, you would want to look too as far as what are the, and I know because we have dips and things like that people use instead of speed bumps. So uh, I, before you get into just because of one specific street, we did it because of a blanket statement made by Cal Fire and Riverside County Fire. That's why we did what we did. So that's a little history on that. So I hate to see just use one street. Yeah, we haven't had any problems. Well, yeah, but at the same time, and that's why we did the ordinance. Thank you. <laughs> the motion that we put Ted's cell number on this particular. We don't want to approve spikes. That's what you want is spike strips. You don't want them flying down the hills so they don't end up down in your guys' neighborhoods. Yeah. And with that, any more questions? I don't have one for specifically for Chad, but maybe Gina and Andy. We looked through all this, and maybe it's going to come up on all our funding sources for all these uh, projects. I saw Measure A, I saw TUMP funds, I saw DIF funds, I saw every kinds of funds. I didn't see any measure mention of Measure R funds for any of these projects. Uh, so our projects will be coming back to you when the, uh, uh, the Citizens Oversight Committee has uh, finished their, their job on that. Okay, I, I'm I'm just I'm asking because I didn't see it. And that's I saw one here on ADA, uh, one of the little handouts we got. Uh, measure R capital funds regarding citywide ADA assessment. That's why I asked. Is there more? Yeah, initially we we, we thought about having in, having it here with the hope that the job would be completed, but they are still working on on the projects. 
and hopefully we'll bring this back to you your first bidding in August is what we are hoping for okay so then by then we'll have all their input minutes and that's correct okay thank you really quickly um, does the city clerk have any cards on this topic yes we have one card Bill Naylor thank you First of all, I'd like to congratulate you guys on all the work you were doing on your budget. I have listened to almost every bit of it, and I think you guys have approached a lot of uh, good projects that need to be taken care of. A couple of things. Uh, again, thanks, uh, Greg, for um, reminding uh, staff about the volunteers that can do things with the city to, to help save city funds and or uh, materials for future use. Um, the other thing that I would like to just, uh, mention is you guys at a previous meeting had talked about uh, possibly reducing funds or restoring funds to uh, the planning department for code enforcement. Uh, concerned that you might need some additional funds for the city prosecutor or different things. I'd also like to throw something out at you that would be under a capital proje project for that particular program. Um, as you, most of you know, I used to do code enforcement for a number of years for another city. And I was able to very effectively use staff time by having a computer program that would allow scheduling of my appointments, uh, inspections, uh, writing letters, because if I can go through with a computer program and say, okay, I'm at this site, I, these are the problems I see, da 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 da, put it into the computer, the computer will actually generate a lot of the letters and things that need to be done. And I've talked to staff a little bit, and it, it sounds like they're still doing it the old way with just writing notes and doing that, and coming back and having to type the letters and things like that. So I just wanted you to think in terms of maybe you might want to do some checking with other cities to see what types of programs that they are using, because I know was I, when I was leaving, there was actually some new programs coming out where you could actually be in the field with your I, <clears throat> with your iPad or whatever, do it, and by the time you got back to the office, your letters and everything would almost be ready to go. Just sign them and off they go. It'd be much more efficient, and it is a, a cost, and your IT people would have to help you with that, but I think it's something to, to really look into, whether you do it right away or within the next year. I think it's a good a project to look at. Thank you. Uh, Madam Mayor, I can answer that. It's actually in the budget. It's in the community development uh, portion of the budget. Uh, Steve's been working on that uh, for the last year and looking at various programs, and we have selected one which will also merge with our financial system. And everything that Bill just articulate is part of that program, which includes code enforcement. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so we will bring it back for council discussion and direction, which I think we've done uh, according to the council, like our only change at this point is the fire station, correct? The and that was to change, change the fire improvement projects from the total budget of 280000 to $220,000. Uh, change. <coughs> Uh, the line item being changed, fire station number 57 improvements, reducing that from 120 to 60,000. Ted's phone number. Just, re just regarding the doors, mm -hmm. the overhead doors, and, and for staff to work with Cal Fire. Can I add something? We'll, we'll take a look at station 17 because I know that's one that he all looked at, and we'll work with them on whatever that will be. It's in beautiful downtown Rubido. I know by ordinance that we uh, we said if we wouldn't put uh, um, speed bumps in, but I, I think we ought to leave those in. That's it's one location, and why not just leave them in because people are used to them. Um, rather than make a big deal of you know having the fire department having to do a big. We know we're not going to put them in any other place, but maybe just leave them in in that location because people have come to expect them. I'm just wondering what action of council that would take because we'd be going against an ordinance that we passed. So I just want to make sure 
that's the pleasure of council that it's done legally and correctly. Of the ordinance, yeah, yeah, that's what I figured. And why we, you know, we had the ordinance, and unfortunately, none of us are engineers or safety engineers or traffic engineers or our safety personnel. And there comes a point where we have to defer to the quote experts that put their little seal on those for the liability. If well, that, that, that goes without saying. I mean, I, oh, I, mean I, 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 I understand what you're saying. I, I, I agree with you, but it was something that was based upon our safety personnel's recommendations why we made that ordinance. And I think we have to stay consistent in the city. That was also the recommendation of the city engineer, not just the fire department, clearly. City engineer was uh, uh, I just thought I'd bring it up. I think that it's been there for 25 years, and but it's up to you guys. Well, that's I, it would have to be brought up under other items at the end of a regular council meeting to be agendized, correct? Okay. Oh, we could I'd like to say that, uh, I mean, I agree with council member Bash, but since the chief opened it up that I think it would be better to further study this. Maybe things have changed, maybe certain directions. Um, there's a lot of other cities out there that have speed tables, traffic calming, speed bumps, whatever, with no impacts to public uh, safety and response times. We don't want to increase response times, I get it, but maybe there's another way and, and, and other people to talk to with other ideas because um, that's not the only street we need help on. So uh, if, 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 if the chief is willing, I'd like to stay with that original discussion of let's study it and then but we can talk about, as the mayor said, under other matters. Yeah, just ask for it to be meeting. agendized and we'll take care of it that way. I was just typing a note to Chief Lane, so we'll have a okay. follow-up item to make sure we have all of uh, the information that's available and we can help provide some good info on, a, on an informed decision. Perfect. All right, so anything else under council discussion? Just one clarification. And only because we've been do getting changes to our general fund budget. Are we going to go? We're going to have to finally approve all this stuff eventually tonight, later on. So I can say, I'll say my questions for that. Thank you. Nothing else? All right. This meeting is adjourned at uh, 5.50.